Recording in progress. All right. That's, that's, that's actually a good sign that I can get all the technology hooked up, which is why all the other recordings aren't what they're supposed to be. So. All right, so if you can picture, let's turn to Acts chapter 16. If you can picture the second missionary journey. And these things will actually all play together. You begin to see the themes of why I think Philippians is so, Philippians is one of those important chapters or important letters. Um, I, I think I've shared with you, when, the very, when I got saved, the very first uh, formal Bible study I did uh, was a, uh, I think it was a, a Warren Wearsby study on, uh, on Philippians. It was a, uh, Be Joyful, I think was the title of it. So I think I still have it, and it's quite yellowed and bent and dog-eared, and, but it's, uh, it holds a fondness in my heart to come to it. Now, to come to it uh, these 46 years later, uh, it was a long time. <laughs> Actually, 49, now that I think about it. All right. Um, You're pretty good looking for 180 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Um, <laughs> wise, too. <laughs> the, um, the Philippians holds a fondness in my heart, just you know, thinking back. Um, and yet, boy, I wish I knew then what I know now, um, just to think about the importance of Philippians and really the deep truths that are there. And we'll, we'll look at those together. We'll look at kind of an overview of not only the history leading up to Philippians, but also the kind of the, the three themes that are there and an overarching view about Jesus Christ. So let's turn to Acts chapter, I might actually turn you to something I didn't tell you, but Acts chapter 15. Um, when we come to the second missionary journey, things actually started off kind of poorly after things started off really well. So Acts chapter 15, uh, starting at verse 36. Right. Acts chapter 15, verse 36. We're going to read down through verse 40. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers and sisters in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with him also. But Paul was of the opinion that they should not take uh, along with them this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Now, again, what's really interesting about the phraseology of that, that's Luke's commentary upon the character of Mark at this point in time. Um, now, now it turned into such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas, and they left after being trusted by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. So what we find is in the very beginning, as the, the second missionary journey gets started, is that the Lord is actually opening and closing doors. But have you ever had a disagreement with somebody? <laughs> no, never? Um, the, I was down in Florida this week at a, at a what's called a, a mediation conference. It's called the School of Mediation. And it has to do with biblical counseling. Biblical counseling and mediation kind of go hand in hand. But it was about resolving conflict and understanding the issues and, and the you know, the, the principles and the and the uh, the interests that people have and how to go about resolving them and getting them you know stated and how do people reconcile uh, about them um, resolving issues with people is hard it's hard work and especially hard if you notice that it's the apostle paul and the apostle barnabas who are having a disagreement and apparently it's a disagreement in public is there anything worse than a disagreement in public i mean here, here you are and everybody knows it Luke, of course, knows it. Uh, Paul knows it. Barnabas knows it. Mark knows it. I mean, imagine the feelings that these people have. And to the point, they're saying, we can't get along. And that's the introduction to the second missionary journey. That's the way things started. How do you think it's going to go? <laughs> and so you know, this kind of gets us into, Paul will visit Philippi at the end of the second missionary journey. But that's kind of Paul's mentality of getting going, is that, Things didn't go well as we got this started. So the Holy Spirit you know, directs and closes doors left and right. And then finally a vision uh, as, as Paul, under, you know, Paul gets to the end of you know, the far western end of Turkey. And as the things aren't going right, I mean, one thing after another, uh, a vision comes to Paul of a man standing from Macedonia saying, come on over. And so Paul picks up his, uh, his, his team and they go off over into Macedonia. And that Macedonia, they cross over at Troas. I think we've talked about that before, crossing over from Troas to a place called Neapolis. Um, they'll land there, and now they're all of a sudden, they've gone from Asia to Europe. 
And so this is going to be really the first converts that are in Europe and the first church that are there. Um, over into uh, Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 8, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region after being forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Again, it gives you a kind, a kind of an idea of conflict started it. They got to the west end of Turkey and the Holy Spirit saying, you, know, you can't talk to anybody. We're not directing, God is not directing you to, to work with anybody here in Asia anymore. And how frustrating would that be? Because Paul has been in Asia before and ministered the word. But have you ever known that when God says, you can't do this and closes all the doors for you to not be able to do that, that he has something different and better planned, right? And we find that to be true because this would be uh, really Paul's call to minister to the Gentiles, not just in Asia, but in Europe as well. So I, I left off. Uh, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region after being forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go to Bithynia and the spirit of Jesus did not allow them and passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. So what's interesting is that this aspect of <coughs> unity and trusting the spirit will be a theme that's in all of Philippians. So even as Paul gets to Philippi, and he'll write the letters sometime later. I mean, this is not like second missionary journey, visit to Philippi, and then later on, pretty quickly, a letter to Philippi. We'll talk about the timing of it later on. But there's this idea of unanimity, this idea of being united in spirit, will catch up to the, to the church as well. All right, so go down to verse 11 in chapter 16. Uh, again, we'll just, we'll just uh, march through a, a key, few key passages. Verse 11, so uh, uh, verse 11 to 40, we're not going to read the whole thing, but uh, so putting out to, to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course from Samothrace on the day following to Neapolis. So they've, they've gone from Troas to Samothrace to Neapolis. Now these are really famous places in the, in the region, uh, but Paul's busy, busy going there, and it's almost like he's on a mission to actually get to some uh, city center. And so then verse 12, and from there to Philippi. It's about nine miles from Neapolis. Neapolis would be the port, uh, and, and Philippi would then be the major city behind there. You didn't want to put your major city right on the sea because the sea comes to visit. <laughs> and and uh, we've seen, of course, many floods in many places. Uh, so nine miles in, uh, you go from Neapolis, would be the port, and you would get to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And, uh, we're, they were, and we're, we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside, to a, uh, outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. So again, this is around, just to put a time frame on, this is around, the, the, around 49 to 50 AD. So this is uh, certainly you know, almost, almost 20 years after Jesus has gone into heaven. So and this is quite, uh, quite a long time has passed. Paul has, as we've, we've talked before, Paul spent some time in the desert. Paul spent some time on his first missionary journey. And now his second missionary journey, he's coming back through and he, he had visited in Asia. And now he's into, finally into Europe 20, 20 years later. And he's visiting, um, uh, visit, gonna be visiting Philippi. As we saw in our, in our study in Second Corinthians, Paul visits Philippi just before his visit to Corinth for the first time. And as we saw in 2 Corinthians, Paul visits Corinth just after his visit to Philippi again. So Philippi is like a regular stopping point for Paul, and he'll visit the Corinthian church afterward. It's just because of a natural bend of go from Troas up to Neapolis to Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea, and then on down the coast to Athens, and then down to, to Corinth all the way. Um, so it's just a, a natural uh, way to go. Uh, but this is a, his pattern. So what he also says in here, which is kind of interesting, is that Philippi is a leading city of Macedonia. It's not the largest necessarily, but it's a leading city. And part of it was due to its, pro its proximity to so many things. You, you, were, you had proximity to um, Neapolis, which was the seaport. So you had trade routes that are people looking to drop off and, and, and take on things that were coming in and out of the region from Neapolis. And you wanted, the Romans would want to take control of that whole trade route. And so they would have, they'd have people uh, stationed there in Philippi. But not only that, but there was a, uh, a, a route called the Ignatian Way, which is kind of like the Roman road, 
uh, would come up through Macedonia and it would travel right through Philippi. So you had a, a water trade route and you had a physical land-based trade route and Philippi was right in the center of, of both of those two things. And then the third thing was that there were some gold mines that were right nearby. Now, gold is one of those things, and we'll talk about the, the color purple, why that's important later on, but uh, Rome liked to control gold because it was, a, it was part of the currency as well. So they had a lot of prosperity due to these three things, the Neapolis, uh, the Ignatian Way, and the gold mines that were nearby. And so Philippi was the natural city. And uh, each of the leaders dating back to really the beginning of Rome uh, itself, uh, the Romans would want to have somebody there. And so they made the city a, uh, a Roman, not only a Roman colony, but a Roman city. So it was as if you were standing on Roman, you were sitting, standing physically on Roman soil was the thought. And so you would have Roman citizens with Romans, all the, all the uh, blessings that Roman citizens would have. And, uh, and so it, the Philippi carried that entire weight of being that kind of a city. All right, so um, as a colony, uh, someone has said that Philippi was in fact Roman miniature. Um, and and in, in giving them this title uh, of uh, a colony of Rome, Augustus gave Philippi the, a, a privilege by which the whole legal position of the colonists in respect of ownership, transfer of land, payment of taxes, local administration and law became the same as if they were on Italian soil. And as Roman citizens, they enjoyed freedom from scourging, arrest and the right of appeal to Caesar. Of course, those things we know about Paul, those things were in, in, uh, in Rome as well. And while Latin was the official language, Greek was, was spoken as well. Now, you know, just a little bit about Philippi. Not every, citizen, not every town or village or city in Rome was a Roman colony, nor were the residents just by the fact that they were owned by Rome, nor were the residents by Roman citizens. That was a right that was conferred by, by Roman emperors. Cities were part of a colony and given Roman citizenship because of some strategic advantage. Can you think of three strategic advantages? Neapolis, Ignatian Way, and the gold mines. So Philippi was important to have someone there that were Roman citizens who could protect the interests of Rome. It's why it becomes really important. Um, and this aspect will become important um, really towards as we get down to even in Philippi itself towards the end of chapter one. Paul found himself looking for a synagogue uh, along the riverside. Um, they had not found a, a group of Jews who were meeting as a synagogue, but what they did find was a group of people who were meeting as a house of prayer. Okay, so let's, let's go back and take a look at that. Verse 13 of Acts chapter 16. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. Um, Chrysostom, did I, Gina, did I get that right? Chrysostom? Chrys uh, uh, yeah, Chrysostom. I don't know. Yeah, I'd go with Chrysostom. <laughs> Chrysostom? Yeah. Chrysostom? I don't know. Yeah. It's like a disease. <laughs> I get Greeks across the street from me. Yeah, yeah. Right. so Chrysostom, we'll go with today. Uh, he had a comment on this verse. He said, Paul thought it likely that the prayer meet would be here. And according to Josephus and, and Philo, Philo, Philo's the bread, Philo's the, is the, as the uh, writer. Uh, the Jews had houses of prayer. Um, Josephus writes this in Antiquity. He, he says, the decree of the, those of Halicarnassus, we have decreed that as many men and women of the Jews as are willing to do so, willing to do, may celebrate their Sabbaths and perform their holy offices according to the Jewish laws and may take the prosuke at the seaside according to the customs of their forefathers. Prosuke is the house of prayer, the prayer take their prayers. And if anyone, whether he be a magistrate or a private person, hindereth them from doing so, he shall be liable to a fine and be applied to the uses of the city. So what Josephus is saying is that if there wasn't going to be a synagogue, it was the regular practice of Jews to find a place by a riverside or a stream um, or some body of water to have a house of prayer. If there weren't enough men to form a congregation or a synagogue, then they would actually have a house of prayer. Paul, not finding a synagogue, said, okay, synagogue one, nope, didn't find that, house of prayer, number two, let's go look at it. And they went and found, uh, found him there. And Paul found this assembly and then sat down to discuss with the women who had gathered there. And that's where we find then, just you know, as we look over in Acts chapter 16, uh, some of the 
Um, the people are there. We find a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. Thyatira is back in Asia, but she found herself there being a, a woman who was a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, and was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul, which makes Lydia the very first European convert. Yeah, that's there. Um, now, she's in being a seller of purple is an interesting nomenclature. Uh, Lydia and, and her household members were converted, and she invites Paul and her his entourage to stay in her house because you can, and we'll get into to why. Um, uh, I have things out of order. I hate that. Um, but but Lydia was a rather wealthy woman because of the seller of purple. There were two kinds of ways you could make purple. One was a, a simple. Uh, you know, one animal was a cell, was a would create a purple color, uh, but it wasn't the deep purple that was, was desired for um, fabrics relating to um, you know, leadership in a country. So there's a deeper purple, um, and I I'll, I have it on my notes. And I'll, I'll let you know what it is when I get there. Isn't it a snail? Uh, it's a snail of some sort, yeah. And uh, in, in crushing that snail, it makes a deep purple. Now Rome, when it wants to control things, it doesn't want everybody to have purple. Because that would be that's the symbol of being a Roman uppity up, um, or schmuckety schmuck, depending on which country <laughs> you're talking about. Uh, but it, that deep color of purple was inherently viewed as being royal royalty, and you don't want everybody going around with color of royalty. You might get more favors than you deserve, and so um, Rome looked to control that color and the distribution of it and the manufacture of it by essentially sponsoring Lydia. Right, so she's not just a seller of purple, as in the, the light, the light hue of purple. You got it's the deep royal purple that the, that the Romans controlled. Uh, so it's um, it's interesting that when Paul again then stays at her house, that they're staying in her house because she's wealthy, she's wealthy, and she's protected and she's connected, and not in a bad way. She's just and she she comes to saving faith, and she's the first person, right? I'm having a hard time, not a hard time, but since that she's a worshiper of God, how would you explain it? I mean, she also knows Christ personally as Lord and Savior, yeah. Well, she will, yes. Yes. Yeah, so what it's talking about, her worship of God, is that one, she's Gentile, right? But she, who's she gathering? The Jews, right? So it's it's kind of a, a, a uh, nomenclature or a phrase. It talks about one who's essentially a proselyte, who wants to be in all manner worshiping with the Jews, even though she's not Jewish. And so it was a, it was a phrase of, used in other places as well to talk about people who were Gentile, but wanted to associate with the Jews and be in all respects Jewish, even though they weren't Jewish by blood. So it could have been from like the scattered church in Jerusalem, people that have... No, no, she was not a believer at all. I mean, this, she was a... Uh, I mean, to witness of them and all. No. No, because this is her first. I mean, she's she's in Europe, and and uh, and this is any, anybody's first foray into Europe whatsoever. Uh, so it's she's there as a worshiper of God, as a Gentile wanting to work worship as a proselyte in a Jewish fashion. And it was it was I won't say there were a lot, but there weren't there weren't a little either. There were a, a good number of people who were in this category of wanting to. They knew of God, whether it's uh, when you look at, at Psalm ch you know, chapter 19, you know, the first, what, four verses, five verses talks about how you can look at nature and see the fact that there's a God. But, you know, the last half of the chapter is you understand what's called special revelation that really takes to understand, okay, I see these things and I see the created order. Oh, that's, that's probably God himself. And so it's God himself revealing it through creation. It's like that kind of thing where you say, I now understand there's a God. I want to worship that God. And you find the Jews and worship them. I remember a missionary telling me that there was, it was in Africa and the natives were always had their little statues and stuff and worshiping their gods, but there was one up in the tree and that's what he was doing. He said, I'm worshiping the God in the And so it's something similar to this that now she will look at it. But, well, but she knows the God of Jacob, uh, Abraham, you know, Jacob and Isaac. Yeah. So she's not worshiping any old God, it's, she's worshiping the God of Abraham. And and <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, Let's see. 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 Let's
All right, so uh, uh, thanks, Brian, for the question, though. All right, so it, she's in a special spot. Of God's essentially, through her life, um, primed the pump, so to speak. He's given her every aspect of understanding that when she gets there and Paul meets her, she's ready to accept Christ because she knows the living, she knows of the living God. You know, think about today. The, the problem we have with sharing the gospel today is that whereas 50 or 60 years ago, people had a concept that there was a God and they were willing to listen and you could almost jump right into, hey, here's sin and here's someone to overcome sin. Now in sharing the gospel, we really start back one step of saying, this is God who is the creator to whom we owe allegiance. And then, but we rebelled. I mean, so you're, you're starting one step sooner. The first step God had done through whatever, through whatever manner, and she was ready to understand who God is. She probably even understood her own sin, which is why she's worshiping with the Jews. Now she's being told that there's a Jesus who came as savior for her sins. And so she accepts that and right off the bat. All right. So, so good question. Thank you. Um, so, so Lydia and her household, and, uh, and, and you find then, uh, not only Lydia and her household, but you find um, the, the slave girl, you know, Paul upsets the economy yet again. Um, he, he'll do it uh, in, when he gets to Thessalonica too, because that's it's what he does. Uh, he, he's, he's done it already uh, he, uh, later on. He, later on, at the end of the second missionary journey, he'll do it in, in Ephesus, uh, and they'll drag two people through the streets and yell at them for a couple hours. Um, Paul, in, in bringing about conversions in a city, sometimes, in this particular case, you know, the, the spirit's cast out of this girl, and the guy who was essentially her pimp, uh, who, who, through whom she would tell uh, stories or you know, tell a fortune, th that income's removed from him. So he gets a little bit upset that he's you know, upsetting the economy. So he has Paul arrested. And of course, when having Paul arrested, Paul meets a jailer. Yeah, we almost need the ushers now. <laughs> right. So, you know, so this, you know, Paul gets arrested, and and the jailer. We'll talk about the jail in a little bit. Um, but but again, Paul meets the jailer. The jailer is converted. So now you have three converts in the space of days of Lydia. Uh, the slave girl and the jailer. And what happens is they begin to meet, apparently in Lydia's house, as a church. So now that you have the first converts, you have the first church in, in Europe, all in the town of Philippi. All right, let me stop there real quick. Any questions? Criticisms, complaints? John. Where Paul is uh, paying attention to the spirit, you can go here, you can't go there, and so forth. Is that a continuation of how in the Old Testament, God spoke, really spoke to people? Can't, you know, he was like Paul is so clear. Like, no, we can't go there. Yes, we can go here. So I'm getting to think like, the Spirit doesn't tell me to go here, or there, like that. Yeah. So is this a, a special thing, or is it a continuation of the Old Testament kind of communication? I'm not sure if it would be continuation of the Old Testament. And this is my personal view. Without a lot of study, is that um, this is because Paul's an apostle, and Paul's been given a special charge to take the gospel to the Gentiles. God is trying to make sure he gets to where he's supposed to go, when he's supposed to be there. So that, you know, for instance, Paul gets essentially stopped from doing any more work in Asia, even though he'll come back and do work in Asia later. I mean, Ephesus is in Asia, he'll return to it. But Paul said, or God is essentially saying, I've got, I've got people lined up for you to go see. I've got appointments for you, in, 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 uh, and you, so you better get there somehow. And so we don't know the manner of that communication, whether it's verbal or it's just the fact that all of a sudden things didn't start working out whatsoever. And so you stop and say, God, what do you have planned? And so that's you know just kind of looking at it. And apparently he gets an answer. It's not apparently he gets an answer. Yeah. Well he gets a, and, and specifically we see we right. see that he gets a vision of the Macedonian man. Now so now you know the origin of that song. I've heard the Macedonian call today. What's the rest of the phrase? Send the song. Jesus says. Yeah. Send the light, send the gospel light. Yeah. Yeah, so but that's the origin of that song. Is that is there's a there's a vision that appears uh, from Macedonia saying, come on over. We got I got I got appointments for you. I got things lined up for you. All right. Um so now let's go down to um you know Paul when when Paul's released from prison, um Paul pulls the I am a, a Roman card, uh, alluding to the fact that the authorities 
the authorities didn't even try to ascertain whether Paul was a Roman citizen to begin with. And, and so, you know, it comes about that you know, Paul is going to get let go, and Paul says, but I'm a Roman, so I want the authorities to come and apologize to me for being a Roman. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens. They go, and the blood has drained from their face. You can, you can kind of tell. So Acts chapter 20, let's go down to, to verse, verse 2. Uh, uh, let me, before I get there, yeah, let's get, go to Acts chapter twenty. But you know, in in, in pulling the Roman card, he says, um, you know, the authorities became afraid and they come apologize and said to Paul, you know, since we've done this to you, you probably ought to leave town. So word of this doesn't get around anymore because it would be an embarrassment because they were a Roman colony, and if you don't follow Roman laws, you can't be a Roman colony, and if you can't be a Roman colony then why do you exist? I mean, it had really serious implications for that. So that now that they were embarrassed and the blood drained from their face because Roman um, authorities would come in and, back, and take back over the city. All right, so, um, so they went and begged Paul to leave. Okay, Acts chapter 20, verses two to three. Um, and when they had gone through the districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. Let's back up. Uh, verse, verse, 20, verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he exhorted them to, and take his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. So Paul, in the meantime, so Paul's been in Philippi. The church is established. He stays there a little while. Um, he moves on down to, like I say, uh, goes from Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea, down to Athens, and then down to Corinth. Remember how long he stays at Corinth the first time? This is a pop quiz from a year ago. So, what's that? Was it a year and a half? It was a year and a half. Eighteen months he's done. Yeah, exactly. So this, now we're finding that Paul begins to unwind, saying, "Now it's time to go back to Antioch, give a report where we're going." Um, and again, he causes a little trouble on the way. There was a, a this is the Demetria and the silversmith. Um, uh, they're going to Macedonia, and in verse two, when he had gone through these districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months, and when a plot was formed against him by the Jews, he was about to sail for Syria. He decided to return through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. But these had gone on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. And again, notice the us, you know, as Luke is on this trip as well. So you, you see, not only has Paul gone to Philippi, gone to other places, and now he's kind of unwinding things, and he finds out this plot against him, and this is kind of the end of the second missionary journey now. He's even been to, to Ephesus, and then he'll go off, and then uh, and and what he does is that he Paul sails to Miletus, which is south, I think, a little bit, a little small island south of Ephesus, and he wants to see the Ephesian um, elders one more time before he goes, just to give them some encouragement and to strengthen them. But again, you'll recall Acts chapter 19, Paul doesn't have a good time of exiting Ephesus either, right? This is when uh, the, the two young men were dragged through the streets and then brought to the auditorium and yelled at for a couple hours. And so Paul's really not trying to stir things up again, but he calls to meet with the, the elders, meets them at Miletus, and Paul goes then back to, uh, when he says back to Syria, back to Syrian Antioch. All right, so what we learn about Paul's commitment to the people of Philippi is that Paul, um, had women who were laboring with him. Um, turn over in Philippians chapter four. And we'll make, we'll make some bigger comments about this uh, as we walk through it, but um, when, uh, so I, Philippians chapter four, verses two and three, I urge you, Euodia and I urge Syntyche uh, to live in harmony with in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with the Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, we know from the, the words that are here, these are actually women who are in the church and Paul's urging them to get along. And I'll talk, make some more comments before we finish today. But Paul's also saying these, these women were important to us. They were part of our labor part of our co-labor to actually minister the gospel in this region. So we didn't just go there and we did it all ourselves, but rather we went there and as converts came about, these people then took the gospel as well. So they were uh, 
uh, involved in that. Um, Epaphroditus, uh, which is who's, who's the he that's there, uh, is taking the letter. Paul came to labor there. We see that in, uh, in chapter 2, verses 25 to 30. Um, and the Philippians were very generous in supporting Paul's ministry. We talked about this when we were at 2 Corinthians. Paul actually kind of leverages them a little bit and says, you know, Corinthians, you promised to give it, but I wanted to let you know that the Philippians, who are dirt poor, they are from, they're like the, uh, they're from the Appalachians in Kentucky, in by comparison. <laughs> they are dirt poor, and they've given out of their poverty to the, to the church in Jerusalem. You, however, are rich. I expect a little more. I expect something different out of you. But he was, Paul leveraged their, their giving and their sincerity. Um, and so we learned that back in, in Corinthians. So that's kind of an introduction of, of how Paul came to it. Again, Paul will visit again uh, right before 2 Corinthians. Um, but now let's, let's just take a little bit of an overview of the letter itself. If you knew you would be dying soon, that's always a good cheery way to begin on <laughs> it. If you knew you would be dying soon, how would that change your outlook on the things in your mind that you wanted to get your good friends to know and to love and for them to do? And it's a somber way to, to look at the book, but I think this is essentially what's going on in Philippians. Paul's in jail. We'll have some more words to say about what, what jail is, but um, we, we've learned a little bit about the, what the special place is. Uh, Paul has people he's interested in. He names people by name in the Philippians book, not in terms of shaming them, but saying, you people have been important to me and to us and to our, our effort. And, and Paul's looking to then, as he is in jail, how do I get them to understand these important things? Because I know I'm about to expire in the scene. Jail's not a, a fun place to be, and we'll talk about it in a second. Um, so Paul has a special place in his heart for the entire city, and he's, you get that from the, his words to Epaphroditus even. Um, it's it's the, the center of a number of interesting uh, facets. It's, it's citizenship, the orchestration of details, and its conversion, how it was involved in church planting. Um, and we know Paul wrote this from jail, which if that's not irony, I, I don't know what is. Because Paul is beginning to talk about their, their joy in Christ. It's kind of the overarching theme that's here. Writing about joy when you're in jail just seems antithetical. It just seems like the wrong end of the broomstick, so to speak. Um, and so Paul himself alludes to the events and gives uh, an indication that they affect him. He, he says in, in uh, turn over to Philippians 1 verse 12, it says, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Huh? We would think, you know, you and I would normally be thinking, if we're going to jail, we're ashamed. We're embarrassed that we're in jail. Paul is saying quite the opposite. Uh, I'm in jail partly because I've been proclaiming the gospel, partly because I've been working for the kingdom. And it's turned out for our greater good because now I have a, a different opportunity and a different platform for declaring those things. And while a case can be made that uh, prison might have been uh, the two-year prison that Paul spent in Caesarea Maritima, which is back in, in Israel, I really think this is the Roman prison. I don't, I don't, think, it's the, the, I don't think this is the nice uh, prison where uh, Paul, wrote, Paul was under the... Um, uh, thumb of Herod, if you will. Paul would actually look to speak with Herod, and probably quite frequently. Uh, I don't think it's that prison. I think this is the, the prison. Now, it's not a hill to die on, um, but, but regardless of where he was, it wasn't a picnic, uh, nor was it any one of our white column, uh, white, column uh, white crime prisons. Um, you know, the, the prison, if you were in prison in, uh, in the first century, you had to provide your own food. You, the, you, your prison, you were given a cell that was often overcrowded. So you had to provide your own food. You had to provide your own clothes. Um, every aspect, it was often dark because it was in the lower part. You would not see sunlight for days or weeks and sometimes months. Um, you can imagine the filth that was there. There was no one going to clean up after that prison but you. So we get the idea of prison, and if you see the pictures even now, I mean, you can go online and find, you know, look for uh, Philippian jail or, uh, and, and, or, or other jails, a Roman jail of, of Paul, and you get this nice pristine, you know, there's a couple bars and this overarch, and it's there, and you can say, well, that doesn't look so bad. 
but you're sh you're shackled, you're manacled to the guy next to you. You had no, you got to provide your own food, which is why it's so essential that um, people had were ministering to Paul. It wasn't just a matter of, hey, Paul came over to play pinochle today. How you doing? <laughs> they were ministering with food, with, with clothing. Um, you would have, generally speaking, uh, the normal uh, your wardrobe would be this huge cloak. And that would be actually your bed clothes as well. You'd wear, you'd wear the cloak around your back. And then when you're ready at night, you just pull the cloak up around you. And that would be what you'd pull up and sleep on. But there would be no pallet. There'd be no hay, no straw provided for you. If you wanted that kind of bed, you're going to have to bring it with you. So just to give you, I want to change your perspective a little bit, that it was not a pleasant place to be. So when he says, I want you to know that my circumstances have turned out for the greater good, Paul's joy is not dependent upon his circumstances. Paul's joy is looking at what God has for him and what's in store for him. This is going to be an overarching theme of the whole chapter, right? It's not about happenstance, it's about attitude. All right. Um, there, there, are, there, are, there are three things that are, um, three themes that we're going to go through um, the, in terms of the overarching look at, at Philippians. Um, the first theme is a theme of unity. Um, it's interesting to note that other than Epaphroditus and Clement, Yodia and Syntyche are the only ones really mentioned by name. So there's really only three or four names that are mentioned here. But Paul does that, again, not to shame them, but to talk about their value to the ministry. And what Paul's looking to do, and, and this is one of my hypotheses about the entire book, is that the entire book is gearing up towards this challenge for Yodia and Syntyche to get along. Now this really becomes important because if you think about how big the church is, well, yeah, you've got Yodi, Syntyche, Epaphroditus, Clement, Lydia, the jailer, the slave girl. Most commentators who voted to, uh, to document the size still only say that it's a church of maybe, and maybe only as many as 50, which would be what would fit in probably Lydia's house, to as she was 20. So imagine, any of you ever, who, who's, who's grown up in a town, um, who's grown up in a town with a population below, let's say, 100,000? Right? Below 50,000, below 10,000, below 5,000. We're nobody there. <laughs> uh, below 2,000. <laughs> uh, actually, it's 2,200. Uh, so wh what happens in a town of 2,200 is you know everybody's business and everybody knows your business. Imagine a church of 20. You know everybody's business, and you know what color the business is. <laughs> now it's purple. That's a Lydia joke. That's another question. Um, no, you you know what everybody's business is, and everybody knows what your business is. Now imagine if in that church of twenty to fifty people, two people aren't getting along. What's gonna What's it gonna do to the ministry? Right. What's that? No? <laughs> you said it. I, I didn't say it. <laughs> right. it is a it is a principle in life that you will have conflict. Would you agree with that? But there are three things you want to know. This is actually some of the learning from this week. There are three things you want to know about that conflict. Right? Conflicts are inevitable. Therefore, expect them. How many of you expect conflict? Right? Yeah. Pe people will disappoint you. I guarantee. And, and yet, what happens when conflict happens? Well, you would believe. And yet, Paul's going to take a different tack. Even He's not going to excoriate them. He's just going to say, let's work through it. And so we, we in our church are pretty blessed about most things whether it's the, the giving or people serving and in a way that I think God gets the glory for that. Because you don't find, other than when I recall how wonderful it is, you don't find a lot of us standing on our head saying, look, we got 42 people coming to Juana and, and only six leaders. What's up? What are you thinking? You gotta come, what? We need your help, come on. We don't do a lot of head standing, head standing on our head to get people to come. We may send an appeal, but we don't, make that big a deal about it. 
And people serve many times because they're being asked and they need to know the need. <clears throat> but imagine if it was full of conflict, how difficult it would be to find service and how difficult it would be to come to worship. And, and, and yet conflict is a part of everything we do because we're human. We have an innate part of us that's still sinful. Conflicts are inevitable, so expect them. Conflicts are sinful. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Conflicts are sinful. Simple or sinful? Sinful. <laughs> sometimes they're simple. Sometimes they're simple and sometimes not so simple. But, yeah. Conflicts. I try to make them simple. Yeah. in the Chicagoland area, our church was smaller. And if there was a conflict at any given time, it disrupted everything. It really did. Yeah. Because it was our church. Well, and, and, it's two, and two things, you know, right? One is we don't expect it, even though we know that we're all sinful. And so when we expect it, we're surprised, and we stand off saying, what do we do? And, and we don't find ourselves with ways that, we're not really instructed on ways to overcome conflict, are we? We, we don't find ourselves, when's the last time you, you heard a, uh, a message from the pulpit on conflict resolution? Or let me, let me make it really personal. When's the last time you taught your children and your grandchildren how to resolve conflict? Oh, <laughs> quit preaching and went to bed then, didn't they? Yeah, conflict resolution is something we need to know how to do, and we do really poorly at it. And then we expect it to be great because we're going to a church with all spirit-filled people. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> you know, again, I, I think the spirit's here. I'm not trying to make a different point. But we don't expect it because we forget that we're, we're sinful. So we, you know, conflicts are sinful, therefore resolve them. Don't put up with them rather than resolve them. Work on the conflict resolution. We'll talk about uh, ways to do that over time. Okay, but Mark. Let me, let me finish one thought real quick. The reason I say that they're sinful is would conflicts happen if there had not been a fall? So the fall introduced what? Sin. Therefore, conflicts are sinful. If there were no fall, we'd all think the same. If there were all, if there was a fall, we if there was no fall, we'd all be unified. We would. But that's the same thing. Like we, how, how do you unify? We think the same way. No, 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 it never happened. We just you wouldn't have the petty personal views towards yeah. positions and interests that are in conflict with one. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. But... yeah. So, okay. Well, yeah. I think you covered my point, which was that sometimes conflicts are necessary to correct. In a fallen world, the conflicts right. are necessary. Yes. But, but I see, I understand that as it being sinful because it's sinful. Yeah. 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 The, at the beginning of the, the hour, when you introduced the separation of Barnabas and uh, oh, they, they did have conflict. In fact, they part ways, uh, one by sea, the other one by land. And uh, the, the, I don't know, is that that's simple or is that a, is it, that a direction? It was absolutely simple. If you go back and read it, it said a bitter disagreement arose. This was not a pleasant, I, I just don't say that way, Barnabas. You go your way, I'll go mine. It was a voice raising, Finger pointing, somebody less some DNA on somebody else's sternum. Agreement. It, it was. It was not a pleasant. It would not have been a pleasant place to be. Now, I'm not saying paint was blistered, but a bitter disagreement's not a polite. You know, they met at while they were pumping gas and said, "Yeah, I, I can't see it that way." Um, I I think that there will always be conflict, but where would be the areas of unity? Well, that's that's really the purpose of the, the letter as well. Really, is it is it even in light of the, these things? Even though there's conflict, and you know, one other point: conflicts are opportunities because it gives us an opportunity of one conflict resolution. It gives us an opportunity to, by the Holy Spirit, work. How do I show love to the other person? Whether it's extending forgiveness or being forgiven, right? Conflicts are an opportunity to show the love of Christ. So that make it a godly conflict. <laughs> it makes it a divine appointment. And in some sense, you can see where 
The whole lead up to Philippi is a series of conflicts that occurred in Paul's life that, that didn't pan out, that essentially forced him into going to Philippi, where he ended up writing a letter to talk about the key theme of unity. Key theme of unity in the midst of conflict. Unity is really the purpose for which we want to resolve conflict so that we can be unified. Now, that's unity is not the same as unanimity. We'll talk about that over time, but unanimity is when we all agree and all say the same thing. Now, those of you who've been in my class long enough know that my next phrase is, if both of us agreed on everything, one of us is unnecessary. We, we're not supposed to be completely agreed on everything. We're as iron sharpens iron. We work with each other and we resolve conflict, but conflict is for the purpose of these things coming together in, a, in an unsinful way. I was just going to say that uh, along with that, that is um, when we do have conflict in our lives, though, and it's unresolved, all it does is it stifles us from being able to continue in our ministry opportunities because we, because that bitterness or that that conflict causes us to, it, it eats away at us. Yeah. And it's constantly on our minds. And uh, the next time I see that person, even though, you know, we may be speaking, there's still that you know, you're still thinking that about that conflict. And so it's best to always get that resolved and move on because we cannot we cannot be a light for Christ if we are holding those. Yeah, and, and, and Jesus was, was quite poignant. Whether it's Matthew chapter five or if it's Matthew 18. If you know your, has, if you know your brother has something against you, go. If you have something against your brother, go. And we've said, I've characterized it before. He who knows, goes. And it, Jesus doesn't let us a whole lot. He doesn't let a whole lot of, I'll get to that one day. But rather, before you even worship, your worship is tainted if you're coming to me and your heart's torn up by conflict. So we, again, we get, we get kind of bitter. And, and that's where I go back to you know, Ben, even to comment. We get kind of torn up with conflict. And, and Paul and Barnabas were examples of, it was not a godly conflict. Now, can good things come from godly conflict? Yes. John Mark was restored. Barnabas showed an interest in, in John Mark, his, his relative, I think his nephew, and brought him along. And John Mark restored in his own confidence and in the Lord. And John you know, Mark writes the, the letter. And John Mark would end up in Ephesus, overseeing probably the life of, of Mary as she's end of her life. So, I mean, there are good consequences that come out of conflict. Paul would not have ended up in Philippi, maybe, with Silas if there hadn't been conflict. So, it can be a divine appointment. But it's not an appointment, appointment by God's plan of, I'm going to put evil in their heart. No, God's not saying that. But God, in his sovereignty, in his providence, allows the conflict to happen, and good things come out of it. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I, I thought I'd remember that he was somebody's nephew. Yeah, Barnabas's. <coughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. So Paul was wrong. Um, they were both wrong. <laughs> Anytime you get to a spot when you have a bitter disagreement, they're, you have two parties not being driven by the spirit anymore and not listening to each other. They don't understand the interests or the positions or the, uh, uh, the issues that are going on between them. And, and uh, those, letter, those phrases fall tip, trippingly off my tongue. That's the conference that I was at this, this last week. So, um, someone asked me how it went. The class was from 8 o'clock in the morning. We went till 8 o'clock Thursday and Friday, and then we did a role play on all day Saturday. So. I know about 11.30 last night. What's that? Is there a lot of conflict in it? <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. The, it was interesting. I'll, I'll tell you some other day about the whole, the whole thing. It was a, it was a terrific class because it's a, it's a wedding of how do you do biblical counseling, but, you know, there's, there's a, there's a form, formal, uh, there's a, f a phase of counseling that almost leads to mediation of people know how to, people know that they should resolve something, but now they are unfamiliar with how to go about it. And, and, and so that's what we're, we're learning. All right, so the second thing. So the, one of the key themes is unity. And, and again, in the midst of conflict, that's what we want to see is unity. It's not like though you, it's a, you flip a switch. Unity and even forgiveness takes time. But in forgiveness is that aspect where I agree not to bring it back up ever again to you. And that's where unity comes is when you start to have that kind of bonding. The second thing, I'll go real briefly, is re re with respect to under attack. It, two times, the Paul, Paul calls the church specifically to uni, unity in, in chapter 2, verse 2, and chapter 4, verse 2. But before each of those calls, Paul refers to or rehearses how the church is under attack. Unity 
And disunity can come from the attack if we let the attack happen. Unity can come from the attack if we don't let the attack occur, or if we're dealing with the attack. How much does that mirror our current political environment? Uh, the church today is under attack, and what the Lord wants is unity. He doesn't want unanimity, not agreement in every last aspect. Right? He doesn't want us to say, we must agree on the shade of blue that's in the carpet. Both shades of blue, because there are two, right? Look down. God's not looking for unanimity where we have to agree on every last thing, but uh, agreement to march forward in the light of the attacks. We have to agreement that the attacks are happening. Disunity often comes on two extremes, usually when we change things, right? Um, when we change things or when we don't change things. Attacks can happen when we change things because maybe they're not introduced correctly, there's not enough communication, it's just a change and I didn't know it was gonna happen and, and we get our knickers in a twist a little bit about how change occurs. Sometimes change doesn't happen. Maybe we want change to happen faster and change didn't happen as fast and we get our undies in a bunch too. <laughs> That's the, that's why that's the English way of phrasing it and the United States way of phrasing it. Um, they don't wear on <laughs> they, they have niggers. <laughs> they get their niggers in a twist and then we get our undies in a bunch. Uh, now we, we sometimes don't handle communication really well and, and so things go too slow sometimes for people. And, and yet both of those times the church is really under attack and what we do with it uh, is really important. Now, um, Again, we'll, as we go through it, but don't miss, don't miss the fact that the unity is called for in the midst of these attacks. And that's what God calls us to as a church as well. Not unanimity, unanimity not agreement on every last detail, but unity that we must go forward and go forward together for the cause of Christ. And the third thing real quick, yeah, sorry. <coughs> oh, no, I'm just- Scratch your nose on your head. <laughs> Play with the beard. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just, I just saw a movie. <laughs> so the third thing then is the coming day. So unity, the attacks that are happening, and then finally the coming day. Six times Paul mentions the coming day. And so think about this. What is it? I think we talked about this in the last week or week before. What is it that we say or we think about every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper? Do so in remembrance of me. Until he comes, there's a there's a remembrance if we if we do so diligently and correctly. There's a remembrance that every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's to be with a view towards the fact that Jesus is coming again, and these should motivate us. Even as we've looked over the last few weeks at the end times and the fact that there are going to be judgments, and we want to welcome that idea of good and faithful servant. Paul's reminding them of that. He wants this to motivate them. Six times Paul's going to mention it, that it should be a motivating factor. All right, so. Um, then, then finally, when we think about overarching, Jesus Christ is going to be the central thing which holds all these together. We don't have unity just because we agree on things. We have unity because we are in Christ and we are one in Christ, or we're one in the Spirit, or one in the Lord. We have unity because we are in Christ and we are one in Christ, as, as Ephesians will tell us. Now, you see that in Ephesians chapter 4. We have, we have strength through the Spirit. We have the example of humility in the Spirit. All these things towards unity and attacks and uh, the coming day, and then finally Jesus bringing it all together leads to this conclusion of Eodia and Syntyche. You've got to start getting along. This is no way for the church to be. So again, the emphasis on Christ is not a separate theme, but something which ties them all together. We're unified in Jesus. We don't make that unity, we keep the unity. We survive attacks because of Jesus. He strengthens us, he motivates us, he models shepherding for us, he models humility for us. And then we look forward to, when we long for the return of Christ, we long to be in his presence and we work towards hearing, well done, the good and faithful servant. So next week, we're gonna pick up and actually start looking at the, the chapters. I would actually ask you to read verses like one to five and we'll, we'll work through that. I'll send out an email as well, as well as the links towards uh, the YouTube. And then this afternoon, I intend to um, move those um, silly technology challenge 
I was technology John, not a thing about it. Um, uh, videos, I'll move those off to my personal site. And just... All right, so as we conclude this morning, any questions? I do, about yeah. the homework, you had, it said, uh, read Acts 16, yeah. semicolon, 20, yeah. semicolon. I wasn't sure if that was everything through or? No, s s s uh, everything through would be dash. So, yes, yeah, so just, <laughs> just 16, 16 Acts 20. That's how stupid I am, I did everything. <laughs> but, but look how prepared you are. Right. <laughs> 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 and Marcus Barnabas is. You, you may have covered this before I got there, but Lydia and it was also in Athens and in the Philippi. No, that was Lydia. Was in Ephesus. There were Greeks that were God fearers. Yes. So what were they? What were they? Hanging? Were they hanging out in the synagogue or were they? In the um, uh, we we did go over it, but it's a good it's a good point that um, God fearers, someone who who is worshiping God. They were, they were uh, people, they were Gentiles who were coming along and essentially identifying with the Jews and wanting to worship with the Jews. Now, even in the temple, there was an area of court of the Gentiles. That's where they, that's as far as they could go. <laughs> as far as they can go. Um, then there's the court of the women, and that's as far as they could go. And then there was the uh, court of men. So, you know, even the temple was arranged to allow and acknowledge that the Gentiles would come and worship at some point. And it was always a view that you know, if you read Isaiah, Isaiah is always talking about um, to take the light to the Gentiles. It wasn't good enough for the light to the Jews, but the Gentiles also. So it's, it's always been part of God's plan. And what we see in the first century is even before that, but you start to see Gentiles coming to, they were believing in God, but they didn't know who Christ was. And so Lydia, then being the first convert, was not the first convert, um, but the first uh, first Gentile in from Europe. Well, she was actually from Thyatira in, in Asia, but first convert in Europe. But good question. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Let's close with prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you again for the day. And even as we see these grand themes in, in Philippians, Father, we do want to be unified. Help us as a church to be wary of the attacks, to understand the attacks, to either avoid the attacks or go through the attacks by the power of uh, the Spirit whom Jesus has sent. Uh, but, but also, Father, we, we think of that coming day when we'll be free of these attacks, we'll be free of our conflicts, and we'll be in your presence. And Father, we look forward to that day. Help us to, to understand these things, help us to, to think of these things, help us to long for these things, all for your glory's sake. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so. Verses one or chapter one, verses one to five, and we're going to go just as fast as you have questions or not. There's no timetable. We don't have to get done by Christmas. Uh, we'll go as fast as we want. Uh, my view is to take somewhat of a more counseling view towards these things. It's just an occupational hazard, rather than a. We're, it'll be expositional, but also we'll be going. Um, I want to kind of the outlook of well, how do we counsel? How do we deal with conflict? How do we deal with? I'll be bringing those aspects at, into it. All right. Talk to y'all soon. Thank you.